All right, folks, we're going to move into Chapter 11, which is uh, Early Medieval Europe. And there's going to be three main areas uh, that we're going to be focusing on. And this time period is going to be what's going to happen after the fall of the western part of the Roman Empire. So this is what's occurring after that period. And those three main areas are going to be what are called the Merovingian and Anglo-Saxon. Let me spell those out for you. First is M-E-R-O-V-I-N-G-I-A-N, Merovingian. And then the other is Anglo-Saxon, A-N-G-L-O hyphen S-A-X-O-N. And this is a specific region in Europe um, that we're going to be focusing on in, in particular. The second region in this area, again, this is all after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, is the Hiberno-Saxon and Carolingian, okay? And those are spelled H-I-B-E-R-N-O hyphen S-A-X-O-N. And Carolingian is C-A-R-O-L-I-N g-i-a-n okay so that's another section and what i'm going to do is specifically tell you what section we're going to be in whenever we look at a piece of artwork all right the third is the atonian and that is o-t-t-o-n-i-o-n -O -O okay so these are all going to be your european areas or areas that are going to be north of italy okay so the western roman empire is going to be that area in Italy, of course, and then a little bit north of that. But everything even further north of that is going to be broken up into these three different areas. All right. Okay, so the first that we're going to look at is the Merovingian and the Anglo-Saxon. And where I want you to begin with that is figure 11.3. And we're going to look at what's called the purse cover. And there, um, there's a few things, a few points of uh, context that we need to know in regards to um, this group of artwork that's going to be occurring after the uh, fall of the Western Roman Empire. And that is that um, most of what they're going to be making at this time is going to be portable. All right. It's going to be a very portable type of artwork. Um, artwork that's going to be placed on purses such as what we see in figure 11.3 the purse cover and it's going to be less of a focus on anything that's stationary it's going to be more primarily on items that can be portable and move around um, so hence the clasp on the purse which is the purse cover that we see here in figure 11.3 um, and some other items to kind of specify what we mean by portable are like weapons so the weaponry is going to be the artistry a personal adornment found in burials like what we see here uh, with the purse cover okay and often these burials um, in these portable items of personal adornment that we're gonna find we're gonna characterize as like treasure laden from like ship burials so around let's say this anglo-saxon area is is kind of up towards uh, well it's up around England and the islands of Ireland as well as England uh, and what we know presently as the United Kingdom um, and in those English canals and all the waterways around that island there's going to be a lots of ships that have sunken and with that those sunken ships we're going to find uh, personal items of adornment and then this is what we find um, in those burials um, also the Vikings um, are part of this group so up north uh, around the uh, Norwegian area, the present day Norwegian area, and a lot of the burials of individuals that are of Viking descent um, were casted out into the ocean once they had passed and laid within the boat and then the boat had all their personal items on them and then um, the boat was set afire at a distance once it, it got out far enough into the waters and um, and from there uh, everything that isn't melted by the fire from the funerary uh, pyre of the ship um, that went down into the waters 
um, would remain as these treasures that are found. So it's a long-winded way of me saying that a lot of the items that we find in this Merovingian and Anglo-Saxon period and area are going to be found from uh, essentially sunken into the waters, all right, as the burial um, ceremony and ritual that they would undertake during this time. Um, <clears throat> here, let me give you some... Let me give you some dates. So the uh, Merovingian and Anglo-Saxon period is going to be from around 410 to 768 Common Era. The uh, Hiberno-Saxon and Carolingian is going to be 768 to 919 Common Era. And the Ottonian is going to be 919 to 1024 Common area, so you can see with those numbers that they're going to overlap. They're all not. They're all not going to happen at the same time. You're going to have the beginnings with the Merovingian and the Anglo-Saxon that will kind of transition out. We'll move into the Hiberno-Saxon, and then that will transition out in Carolingian, and then it will move into the Ottonian, which will be um, the last part of this early medieval Europe period. Okay. Now, with the purse cover, um, it's a burial item, so it was found in this burial process, um, and it shows what we're calling like the hallmark of early medieval art. And what the hallmark of early medieval art is, broken down into two things in particular. One is abstract interfaces, um, so or interlaces, not interfaces, but interlaces. So if you zoom in on figure 11.3 with the purse cover, you can see that there is these interwoven features of uh, interlacing patterns, uh, like in the center top of the purse cover. And then also adjacent to the center top, um, there are other woven-like, uh, entangled, string-like formations, which it looks like um, a whole bunch of knots are getting ready to be pulled together, and they're loose at the present moment. Um, and it's a visual knot. It's not an actual knot, but it's a visual aesthetic knot. And that's what we again call that abstract interlace. So one is you're going to find abstract interlace, okay, so be able to point out what that looks like in an image like figure 11.3 with the first cover. The second is going to be the use of animal figures. And you can see that that's very much present here in the purse cover. So you have the direct center, which looks like two elephant forms, these two animal-like forms. There's And they're slightly abstracted. So abstraction is going to be um, a big part of the aesthetics during this time, all right? So it's going to be in the <clears throat> inner laces, of the patterns and design, which will look abstracted, and the animals will have slightly abstracted features to them as well. All right, so you have those elephants there in the middle. Again, symmetry, you can see they're kind of facing one another. The abstract laces are above them, which are symmetrical, at least within the overall contour pattern, and they're facing one, or they're next to each other. Okay, then drop back down again and adjacent to the side of the two elephants or what appears to be like elephants in the middle are almost these bull-like abstracted figures, okay, that are running north and south, up and down. And then that there's a figure in the middle that's standing there um, where it's centralized, like this abstract figure that's centralized in between these two bulls, which should look very familiar like with the harp, um, the musical harp that we saw all the way back in ancient Mesopotamia. It's very similar to that register on that music box that's on the harp um, where you had that ruling figure that's very, his face is very frontal and his body's very profiled and he has his arm around two different bulls that also have the same head of that ruler, of that Mesopotamian ruler. So you can see some of these techniques are starting to come back, which segues into this type of of process uh, for the purse cover and let me spell it for you it's called or this is how you spell it it's c l o i s o n n e with a hyphen on the last e or on that e and that's called the closian closony uh, and it's a very old type of soldering metal to metal uh, but it's a very specific type of soldering. So you'll have your main plate and then you'll have your design <clears throat> of metalwork that is going to be uh, up on its side. So think about laying down a flat piece of metal, right? That's horizontal and flat. 
Then you're going to take the accompanying pieces that are made of metal and you're going to flip them up on their sides. And then you're going to solder those in vertically upon that horizontal plate. Then you're going to inlay it with metalwork or you're going to inlay it with other materials like gold and glass. All right. And then it's going to be ground down. So let me break that down to you one more time. This technique with the first cover is called the cloisonne. That's C-L-O-I-S-O-N-N-E. -N -E, and it dates all the way back to the Egyptians. So the Egyptians were soldering. Okay, They weren't casting metal like the ancient Mesopotamians with, with bronze and copper, but they were soldering metal. And they figured out how to heat up metal to solder and make it hold and make it compatible in their jewelry and jewelry another word for jewelry is metalsmithing so this would be called a metalsmithing all right or jewelry purse cover jewelry or metalsmithing um, and it's small it's soldering small metal strips on their edges edges up to a small metal background okay and then it was filed down inlaid with other precious material like you can see here with gold and glass and remember during this time glass was almost just ex as expensive as gold um, because it was difficult to render and to keep because it would easily break and then it was filed down and it was inlaid with this material and that specific process to get this technique and this design is called that uh, cloisonne so c-l-o-i-s-o-n-n-e with a, a, a accent on the the e at the end all right all right, and then um, what we're going to do, uh, this is the main piece that I want you to focus on in regards to um, the personal body adornment. Now we're going to take a look at some ships, okay, a Viking ship, a burial ship. And so figure 11-4 is, um, is where I want you to go. And this, again, is going to be their ritualistic form of, of bearing and giving homage to an individual that has come to pass. And if you look at figure 11-4, you can see on the front of the ship, there is that abstract interlace of pattern, okay? That curve, that bend that goes up to the spiral. It is that interwoven interlace of abstract design and pattern. So again, we're going to see that present during this uh, Merovingian and Anglo-Saxon period. All right. And this burial process actually comes from one of their stories, one of their Viking stories of Beowulf. Um, and the story of Beowulf was about sending a great hero out into the rivers or into the ocean after passing and that body being inside of this boat all of those precious belongings of that individuals, which we would call relics today, are with him. And then once casted out in the water, it was shot with a fiery arrow. And then, boom, it went into flames. It burned for a period of time, so then it sunk into the waters. And it was a transitional uh, religious moment of sending that person into, um, into Valhalla, when Valhalla is the place in which great warriors go, that the Vikings and the Norse um, beliefs indicate uh, where you fight alongside these great godly warriors and you become part of that group against uh, evil. All right. So they're very much a warrior class mentality. So that's what these burial ships were used. But the burial ships, you can see, again, have these interlacing abstract designs. And you can see it even more thoroughly in figure 11.4a and 11.4a the animal head post of a viking burial ship um, indicates both that abstract interlace which is making up the abstracted animal form okay so when you look at figure 11.4a that animal head post you should see how both of those styles during this period the merovingian and anglo-saxon time is using both it's incorporating both abstract interlace and also animal figures that are slightly abstracted as well all right um, again it combines the two let's see um, this time it's carved versus that inlaid and soldering technique of the purse so be able to differentiate the the two different techniques here it's carved out of wood 
all right, which means that we're removing and extracting or etching away on the surface to get the overall design. And then we're cutting and carving in deeply to bring out all of that depth and shadow work that you see in the abstract interlaces. OK, so it's a removal and a subtractive process versus figure 11.3, the purse cover. It's an additive. A modular process you have individual pieces that are soldered together then inlaid on the inside so it's an additive modular process versus a subtractive carving process of 11.4 a um, which I know it's been a little bit of time since we last talked about <clears throat> the difference between the carving or the subtractive artwork and the additive artwork so know that the animal head post from the Viking burial ship is a subtractive process from the wood and that the purse cover that we see in figure 11.3 is an additive process using the soldering technique. Okay. Now let me see how far along we are here. I feel like we're getting a lot of good information in. We are. Um, let's look at one more thing in regards to this first section then I'll end this video. And um, again, we're talking specifically about the Merovingian and Anglo-Saxon period, one out of the three with the early medieval Europe. And we're going to look at the Viking Stav Church in Uranus. And that's going to be uh, fi uh, figure 11.5. And again, uh, Ernest Norway. So again, the Norwegian area, which is where the Vikings or the uh, Merovingians uh, originated in particular. All right. So this is the Viking Stav Church in Uranus. Um, you should be able to look at this wood portal of the staff church and see those two main styles. You should be able to look at this and see where there's the abstract interlace of pattern and design and animals, figurative animals. Okay, you should be able to break it down. You should be able to look at this thoroughly and see both of those and be able to differentiate the two. All right, those two styles. Um, it's very obvious when you first look at it that it does have these abstract patterns and styles in this carving technique, which is this heavy high relief. And then within those abstract interlaces, you start to see these these animal figures. All right, kind of biting at each other and they start to emerge in the overall pattern and they become incorporated, but they're also stand out on their own as well. So be able to kind of finely view um, the difference between those two and focus heavily on the bottom left with figure 11.5 and you'll really be able to see the two different patterns uh, stand out, the two different techniques. Um, let's see here. Now it, it is a church and we're talking about a church, but, but prior to it being a church, it actually, they, they, they were polytheistic, so they believed in multiple gods. And but during this time around 10 about a thousand uh, CE or before that, let's see around. Um, yeah, at around about a th about, let's say around 800 to a thousand, we're starting to see um, an influence of Christianity in in these northern European areas. Uh, but prior to that, it was not. So these churches are starting to, to, to develop uh, based off of the influence of Christianity um, a little bit later from the beginning of their Viking heritages and their Viking beginnings, so to speak. Um, yeah, but it shows more in particular, it is a church and it, and it is specifically meant to focus on the worship of monotheism, one God, but it incorporates the old techniques of the Vikings. Um, so it shows Viking artistic traditions. Um, and again, that's going to be the abstractions that you see, as well as the use of these animals. And one thing about the Vikings and the use of their animals in particular is, is they elongate the abstractions and the animals. That's what's really going to make them stand out. Versus if you look at the purse cover earlier on, you can see that the animals are not that elongated. They're more compounded. Uh, more closed formed, but with the animals and the in the in the abstracted features that you see with the Vikings, you're going to see more of elongated features, and that's what really makes them stand out. Um, and the bottom left of Figure 11.5, the wood portal of the Stab Church, 
is um, going to really indicate this this kind of beast, this elongated beast that you see down there. Um, or some of a, some art historians call it a guardian, like a guardian to this portal way, which would be an entrance into the divinity of the church. Okay, so kind of this uh, not imaginative, but this kind of more spiritual like portal way that that makes its way into the church. Um, so that guardian or that elongated four-legged beast is standing next to the portal that you see there to the portal's right and to our left when we're view, viewing the image. And it's biting a serpent, and it's also being bit too, all right? So it's kind of like this good versus evil, this beast is supposed to be, you know, attacking this 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 uh, this creature of darkness, so to speak, if you will, um, this kind of serpent-like form, but it's also biting back, so it's kind of like this balance between light and darkness or good and evil, which is very much a Viking or a, um, a Merovingian kind of concept that dated before the advent of Christianity in this area of, of Europe. Um, so again, some of these old concepts that were with them before Christianity found their way into northern, found its way into northern Europe, are are present here in the wood portal of the Staff Church. Now, one thing I want to end on is the relief. You have high relief and you have low relief. You be you should be able to see the difference on where it's a high relief and where it's a low relief. So high relief is we're going to see the imagery a half to three quarters removed and that's where the heavy shadows are going to be coming out from the carving and then the low relief is going to be where it just looks emboised on the surface of the wall and you can see that on the inside of the portal and the portal itself is almost like this key like shape right in the middle of uh, of this wooden wall all right so be able to differentiate where you see the heavy relief and where you see the low relief and be able to talk about the concepts between the abstracted interlaces as well as the elongated animal kind of abstracted like forms as well. All right. I'll leave you at that in regards to this video. And then with the next one, we'll go on and run through the Hiberno-Saxon, the Carolingian, and the Ottonian. All right. Okay. See you soon.